Electricast. And I was always the one within the circle that was semi-naked or naked and bleeding. So I took that as a message and that really peeled back the layers of the onion for me, not just for the menstrual piece, but for the embodiment piece. So for me, when I came to uh, wanting to be of service, I was just intuitively drawn to, ah, so I first need to heal the connection I have to my moon time. And the best way I can do that is by connecting to it physically. Welcome to the Cosmic Love Antenna Podcast. This podcast is meant to encourage you to connect within so you can share your light with the world. And now, here's your host, Harrison Ma. Harrison Ma. Harrison Ma. Welcome, beautiful, powerful beings, to another episode of the Cosmic Love Antenna. I am your host, Harrison, here as always with a powerful cosmic we'll use the word cosmic, powerful cosmic being to share with you today on the episode. But before I get to this magical being, please remember this episode today, this show at large is your space to connect inwards to your energetic space so you can start expressing outwards, express your love by pulling back the layers, restricting love, alignment, and health. And on today's show, I have a artist, I have a mystic, I have a way shower, I have an embodiment coach, I have the cosmic womb serpent herself, and just coincidentally, also my beautiful sister in this incarnation around the earth. And before I get to her, before I throw her the mic to get her to express her beautiful voice, I want to share with you, the listener now, why you should listen to this episode, what you will get out of it. Today, we're going to go into, with my beautiful sister, Taylor, all things menstrual blood, <laughs> menstrual blood, artistic creation, how we can use our artistic expression as a form of self-healing, spirit animal and energetic artistic expression, channeling ourselves through the artist modality, the artist expression, and so much more. With all of that foundation, with all of these things set now, Taylor, welcome to the Cosmic Love Antenna. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful um, introduction, Harry. I feel very blessed to be here and be speaking to you, my brother. <laughs> and I'm ready for today. I'm ready for uh, this conversation. How are you feeling? How are the nerves? How's the the energy moving through you? Uh, the nerves have dispersed. They've, they've moved. <laughs> the Shakti pad that I'm standing on is helping immensely. <laughs> the, the energy seems to acknowledge, all right, she's in it. She's in it now. She's she's moved through, she's moved through the boundary, the space and place in which we fear we can't move beyond. And now she's in now she's in the unknown. Now we got this. Now we're now we're in control. Now the spiritual being that directed you to this chat with me today, now she is in control. So mm -hmm. Taylor, I want to where I start these chats, as I'm sure you know, as you've heard, maybe by listening to a couple of the episodes, I like to start them for people that don't know who you are giving a little bit of a background and I don't want to go too much into your full story because more and more I'm realizing our story is our story and it adds to us, but what's more important is the here and now, but I do want to know for people listening so they can get a sense of you as we start to take this journey together. What was your biggest pain teacher that led you to being the beautiful artist and creative, expressive person that you are here today? What comes up when I ask that question? Well, you've, you've touched on it already, which was my, my menstrual cycle, my moon time, my period, my bleed. So I was, uh, I guess, like many young women, typically when we are experiencing a period chronic pain with our period, we are automatically put onto the birth control pill where the doctors do not address the underlying issues. They don't address the spiritual, mental, and physical issues. They just straight away pop you onto the pill. So you could definitely say that my portal into everything that I do now was reconnecting back to my womb. And the choice that I made by doing that was going traveling, going backpacking for two years by myself. And before I left Australia, I threw out two years' worth of the birth control pill, just an intuitive hit that I get that I got. The first one you could say that I got was 
throw out the birth control pill, much to, much to the dismay of my mother. <laughs> she freaked out. It was the best thing I could have done, could have, could have ever done for myself. When it's, I arrived in Spain. Uh, let me jump in here, Tal, super quick. It's, and I want to hear about the, the Spain part because I, I know the story. I know where it's going. I think it's really valuable for people tuning in. But I, I just want to make sure people are <laughs> tuning in already to the, how the, the mystical being inside of us speaks in the ways that it does. And we can often, especially if we don't look back in hindsight, we can often in the moment push it away as just a random occurrence. Oh, you know, I got that hit and it was really just nothing, but I just followed it. When in reality, what is going on is that there is something higher at play that's lovingly nudging us, providing a palette of, here, do you want to take a choice here? We, we're like, at the same time as having divine mystical power inside of us, we're also given the, the power of free will. And there's almost in every sort of big life moment, we're given a plate of, okay, do you want to go, do you want to go the apples here? Do you want to go the fruit or do you want to go down this other path? Do you want to go down this other option and you have the power to decide. So keep sharing the storyteller, but I want people to sort of, as we go deeper into your journey and what you're going to share today, have this mystical element sort of playing in the background. So what, what happened when you got to Spain? Mm, so when I arrived in, in Europe, uh, to start off with, my body, I guess, started to reconnect to its natural cyclical nature. So I started to bleed again. I started to, I guess, my hormones and my room heart connection was reconnected. So I started to become even more attuned and highly connected to that mystical self, that higher self. And upon arriving in Spain, I think that was maybe three months into the trip, I was situated around the corner from uh, La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, and I just had another intuitive download to purchase a watercolour pad and watercolour paints. And I hadn't painted since high school. I had lost that desire, I'd lost that drive, that uh, creative um, spark I guess you could say as soon as I went onto the birth control pill, I I was uh, painting throughout high school, but it never it never really was uh, never really wanted to do it. There was no flair there. So when I was in Barcelona and I had that intuitive download, I followed followed it and I went to this most beautiful like Harry Potter like uh, art shop and I purchased my materials and the first artwork that I ever created was of this woman with her third eye open and her head chakra, her head was expanding. So you could say her crown chakra was expanding and there was this, I guess, from my perspective, these mountains of Patagonia and um, surrounding the edge of the artwork and within the middle of the artwork was the, the inner workings of her soul. And I'd like to think that the body of work that I painted when I was in Europe was the reconnecting to mm. all the parts that I had been disconnected to up until that point. So that's the, I think that is the main, so thank you for sharing that Taylor. I think that sets a beautiful foundation of where we're going to go today. And for people listening, I haven't at this point in time, and I probably will in the future, I haven't done a, any episodes on birth control and the pill and all these things, but I think if you've listened to episodes before, you can probably understand that, you know, wherever you are in your journey and whether you've decided to take this as an option in which you live and, and express and, and move in this world, then that's your choice to make. But from a holistic and natural healing lens, we must also understand that there are some things that play a role with the pill. So from a natural healing and holistic perspective, especially within the womb center, if people have heard me talk about the sacral chakra and the connection to the inner child, the connection to creation energy, we know that there's an impact. They know there's something going on from a very, from a very symptomatic perspective and maybe deeper as you're starting to hear from Taylor and the bursting and the expression of her artistic flame being ignited in this, in this journey that she's on. So let's, go a bit deeper now, Taylor, and I want to talk about the menstrual art itself. And I want to, I want to ask you a question, maybe explain it for people 
<laughs> that are new to it. Maybe they're getting their idea of what they can imagine by these words. But what is what is menstrual art? And and then we'll go from there. Explain it to people that are new to it. Uh, so menstrual art, put very simply, is painting pieces of work with your own blood, with your own moon time, with your own menstrual blood, your period. So the way that I do it is I connect it. I collect my moon time in a, a juju cup, a silicon cup, and I use that blood onto watercolor uh, onto watercolor pad. And I import, like incorporate, it's not the whole painting for me because I struggle with just being, uh, for my work, just being one colour, but I incorporate it in with other materials. So the obvious question to ask here is, well, maybe it's not so obvious, but it's definitely coming up in me and maybe, um, maybe if you're a male or female, but specifically female listener tuning into this, how did you move through the potential, how do I want to phrase this, shame or resistance or guilt or, you know, curiosity and, and yeah, I think resistance is the best word. How did you move through the resistance through using something like this as a, not just as an artistic expression, but just as a modality in general? So this, so the answer to this question is quite long. It weaves into uh, sitting in plant medicine ceremonies. So I think for me that particularly helped. I sat in, I've sat in multiple plant medicine ceremonies with the intention of being of service, <clears throat> particularly to women and to the world through my creative means. And how I've, how I feel like I've moved through the shame, the guilt, the even discussed with touching one's blood and moving through the patriarchal programmings that we have to being the moon time being a hindrance was when I sat in ceremony, I had quite powerful uh, outcomes. <clears throat> so each time I sat in ceremony, I would be bleeding, which is in, in and of itself even more powerful because when a woman is bleeding, particularly uh, in from the viewpoint of Indigenous cultures, ancient cultures, and even from my own viewpoint, because I've experienced it myself, the veils are thinner to the spiritual world. You are more susceptible to entities, to whatever wants to be present in that in that room when you are journeying. So that in in of itself was a portal for me to be to to reap the underlying embedded messages of there was a reason why I was always sitting in ceremony and I was always bleeding. And mm. I'd always actually go into the ceremony clothed and be re rebirthed naked. And I was yeah. always the one within the circle that was semi-naked or naked and bleeding. So I took that as a message and that really peeled back the layers of the onion for me, not just for the menstrual piece, but for the embodiment piece. So for me, when I came to uh, wanting to be of service, I was just intuitively drawn to, ah, so I first need to heal the connection I have to my moon time. And the best way I can do that is by connecting to it physically, touching mm. my blood, smelling my blood, putting it on my face because it holds so much nutrients. If you think about it, the, the menstrual, the, the lining of the womb is the potential uh, but as a potential baby is a potential life. So it first started with me going down that journey. So I can feel in the podcast world a lot of uh, resistance and maybe potential triggers to some of the things that Taylor is saying. And I would encourage you, if you're listening to this, be with those triggers <laughs> and ask yourself, is it, is it Taylor that is giving me is making is Taylor making me feel this way, or is Taylor hitting on a very primal and deep truth that may be inside of you that is wanting to be seen and, and is now getting the opportunity? Because I know, and not just as someone that is very intimately connected to her, but just from the things that I've learned and experienced both myself and in clients, that this sacral center holds a lot of guilt and shame that is not only just within our lives, but is very primordial, primordial and ancestral. 
So this idea of playing around with the menstrual, uh, you know, element, the menstrual body, the menstrual th- expression, there's going to be a lot of energetic release going on, whether you're leaning into it or not, even just listening to Tao talk about it, as I'm sure, as I just outlined, as you're experiencing. I guess my next question here, Taylor, with this is how would you compare, and this is what I think is really it's bubbling up in me right now, how would you compare your relationship with your sacral center? So not just the menstrual act, but the sacral center at large, your, your vagina, your, the creation that comes from it, the womb. How would, your, how would you compare your relationship with that sacral area now to what it was like before you hit that trip in Spain and you, and you, took, the, you took the birth control out of the conversation? How would you compare the difference? the blue pill (laughs) so I just had a vision in my head of uh, very young Taylor in incredible amounts of pain having to skip school in bed mum picking her up and just being so lost and confused and misunderstood and just really um, uncentered ungrounded whereas now my sacral chakra my my vulva, my womb, my sexual energy, it is I live in alignment with that area. That area comes first. My sacral chakra is the way I walk through life. I, t- I tap into my womb. I ask my womb. I ask my vulva. I ask my vagina. Does this feel good to me? Is this a fuck yes? Does this feel no? Is this a no? Uh, do I want to go here? Do I want to go there? Do I want to paint this artwork? It's, it's the epicenter. It's, I like to think of my sacral chakra. I like to make this reference of it's directly connected to my heart. It's my second heart. So I live in alignment with my heart womb connection and I walk through the world making decisions from this connection point. So that's beautiful, Taylor. And I want to expand on this. If you're listening to this and you do have a vagina, you do have a womb, you do have this is a male conversation too, but I want to speak to the females here. I would go back and listen to the episodes I did with uh, Kim Vopney, the vagina coach. I would go listen to the chat I did with Heather Tucker around sex and religion. If you do, you'll notice some trends and some themes here. And this is not a Taylor thing that she just outlined all those characteristics as the compass of the, of the sacral center, the reconnection, reconnection and the awakening it's not a Taylor thing. This is a this is an embodiment that we can all step into. And I think what we have to ask ourselves, you know, I don't think I'm I don't think Taylor is implying or I'm implying that we all need to start playing with our menstrual blood. But I think we all need to start having conversation about what it looks like to awaken this sacral center, right? And use it as a way to take a step forward, not just in our healing, but so we expand into more of what we're meant to be. Taylor, I want to change gears here now. And actually, no, before we do that, just one last piece on this menstrual, uh, this menstrual topic. If, if females listening want to get involved with this and want to start connecting to the menstrual act, start reconnecting to their moon time, start connecting into this sacral center through this, through this way, what are some tips? What are some quick tips you can give here before we move on around a female connecting what where, where would they start how could they start this process well i'd first recommend acknowledging that you are a walking breathing representation of the earth you are, you within your vessel you contain the four seasons of the earth so i'd like to first mention that tracking your cycle so day one of your bleed that's day one of your cycle and acknowledging your your cycle all the way up into the next one. So first coming to understand how long your cycle goes for. When you're bleeding, it is you're in the winter phase and then you move out onto spring and then to summer and then back into autumn and then winter and acknowledging that you are a cyclical being, that you have 28-day roughly, it's not the same for all women, but your energy is also not 
that and also acknowledging that your energy is not similar to that of a man's. So we have a 28 day and an energetical cycle as well. So having compassion for yourself and acknowledging that you do not have the same energy as everybody else, as, as men. And I like to also mention that when you're ovulating, which is around day 14 to 11, depending on the cycle, depending how long your cycle is, is when you're the most energetic. This is when you should be planning things in your cycle that are demanding, you know, speaking events and creative projects, like just really tracking your cycle and coming to understand that you have four seasons within the cycle. And then also really connecting in with the moon and her energy and even just maybe starting a simple drawing practice. Now, it definitely doesn't have to mean collecting your moon time with a cup and painting with it. I recommend women even just drawing their womb and how that representation is reflected through the art practice, using different colours, using different symbols and having that maybe posted up near your altar and really connecting into the energy of your womb. How practical, how energetic, how loving. Thank you, Taylor, for outlining the steps. You, you hit on the, the hormonal clock, the monthly hormonal clock, and I would add a, another resource on top of what Taylor beautifully outlined here, a, a book I'd recommend people look into and a person is uh, Alyssa Vitti and the book is In the Flow. And she talks about this circadian cycle. So every a male and a female has a, has a daily hormonal clock, but it, we called the circadian rhythm that we all are probably familiar with. But we also have a, a the female anatomy has a monthly hormonal clock as Taylor outlined. And that is referred to the infradian rhythm. And that is really a big, powerful difference. Did you want to I'd also that? like to add in, yeah, so that's like the scientific backing of it. I'd yeah. also like to add in like a psycho-spiritual aspect of, of where the four seasons come from. From um, I can't remember exactly the name of the book, but the teacher is Alexandra Pope. Yeah, yeah. And the, the seasonal element is really interesting one. I'm about to come back for a chat on that, Taylor. But... Before I want to move on here and I want to set a foundation and this foundation is something I call the sacral tree and the sacral tree is all of the things at the sacral center. If you're looking to heal, you know, whether it's trauma, whether it's, you know, maybe being on the pill, if you, if you have intergenerational elements in the sacral center, we need to start looking at what is connecting into the sacral chakra, the womb space, the menstrual space, the, this female space, or even in the male body, what does it allow us to do? And uh, I refer to something called the sacral tree and the sacral tree, the branch, the, the root, the roots of the sacral tree and the trunk of the sacral tree is the sacral chakra, right? This is in our womb center or in the male, it's just above the genitals. And the sacral tree has the branches of many things, right? It has our relationship to our inner child. It has the relationship between our sexual being. It has the relationship between money and abundance. It has the relationship between the family and the, and the, the different things that we want to create in the world, our creative energy at large. With that set, Taylor, I'm wondering, where do you think, where do you feel that creation energy comes in as a way to heal, as self-heal. So where does the creative act? So for you, for example, it is your artistic expression. How does this help us in our self-healing journey, in your opinion? So this this part taps back into when I was touching on the Spain part and painting a body of work that was healing the disconnected parts. So for me, in particular, art therapy has helped me heal the, the, the disconnect to the menstruation, but from that has knock-on effects. So it's helped me come to understand that I'm a, a healthy, highly active sexual being and that <clears throat> her sexuality is celebrated, not repressed anymore. I then went on to paint about my embodiment and my dance and my expression. And they're all and they're all part of the sacral tree. 
Was there a question of how, Harry? I'm oh, sorry, I got lost there. Yeah, no, I think you're explaining it well. I think I would ask, you know, what is this? What have you seen? So you've talked about this expression. You talked about the dancing. You talked about what what other things has this helped you heal, right? Because I think people hear the the word, the term art therapy or using art to heal, but they don't see, they maybe don't see the tangible response and the outcome of that. So what is art therapy either what have you seen in yourself or what have you seen in maybe people that you've connected to how have you seen it expand and heal and walk further down their healing journey Mm, okay so I'll, i'll go back to what i was saying so it started off the seed was the initial seed was connecting to my menstruation so when i was in spain i was painting i was in granada and i was doing a volunteer in the olive in the olive groves so i was painting olive groves with bulbous uh speckled throughout the artwork so it started there I connected back into my sacral chakra through my womb and my vagina connecting that disconnect it started then to move into the menstruation and then the sexuality piece and then the embodiment expression now for me it is tapping into the ancestral part what I'm seeing come through the artworks now because I've done so much healing and unlocked the uh, blockages that have been located yeah. within my room it has unlocked all this potential of connecting into my ancestry so mm-hmm. my ancestry is one. that of yeah is is we are spanish harrison and i we come from a, a spanish ancestral line but i'm also seeing that because i've become so i've come so far on my healing journey and that is not to say that there is more to go there is forever healing to do in certain aspects of our lives but because i've I've done the work so far. I've opened myself to receive now the the energy of the land. Mm. I'm now picking up past lives. I'm picking up, uh, and basically, I just got shivers down my <laughs> my mm. side. I've healed the connection, the disconnect to my mother line. So I'm picking up everything that wants to come through my mother line. Yeah. I haven't really tapped into the father line yet. Maybe it's in there. Maybe I can't see it. But now I'm really picking up a very ancient vibe within my work. Yeah. So this is it's funny. I, I didn't have this on the list of things to talk about, but it's, it's, I'm glad it's coming up right now. and bubbling up. I, I get, I get this question a lot <laughs> from people uh, either through my coaching work or, you know, being a clubhouse or on the podcast, how do I connect to ancestral healing? How do I connect to past lives? How do I, you know, all these things. And there are many, modalities, tools we can use out there. But the one that we're talking about today, the artistic expression, I think is one that we forget. My One of my mentors, Mr. Paul Cech, calls, describes the artistic, expros- the artistic process as adding love to love, right? When we are making art in any form, so Taylor, it's painting and energetic portraits and menstrual art, but remember, artistic creation could be dancing artistic creation could be singing artistic creation could be making love but definitely have done some episodes on that one but the point i'm trying to make here is when we are in this act of creation we are in an act of love and when we're in an act of love the things that are, are have been left in an act of separation are now now have the opportunity to be brought into the light what are some things that it could be left in an act of separation? Well, these are these are traumas down the mother line or the father line. These are traumas in past lives. So I want people to listen in carefully here as Taylor and I go deeper in this chat. The art, artistic form and being creative opens a portal. It doesn't just open a portal to express your gifts with the world it opens a portal for the shadow to be brought into the light and this shadow could go back very deeply so it's well i'll land it there but i just want people to again acknowledge this we go a little bit deeper i'm wondering taylor what are some examples if you don't mind sharing of some mother wounds so you said the father the, the father line is still new and fresh and you're going deeper into it what are some, just for people interested, what are some mother line elements that you've noticed come up in the artistic form that you've, that you've healed or brought awareness to? Particularly relating to 
ancestors that are still alive? Yeah. So it could be mum, so our mum. So what have you noticed in terms of things you've transcended with our mum mm. or further back in the mother line? So I think it goes, it starts with, you know, I've, I've transcended the, uh, the belief that artists cannot, you know, live a prosperous life, that we are forever stuck in the poor artist, starving artist mode, that I've definitely <laughs> journeyed through many dark nights of the soul of, of even uh, contemplating throwing the art in the trash, ban- trash bin and picking up some other modality to continue my life with, to be of service with. That one has been the most prominent one of receiving abundance from my, from my art, receiving an energetical st- exchange in the form of money for my art. Uh, so that's a big one, but also goes back to it, the, just the predominant one in my mother line. Uh, Mi abuelo uh, was an artist as well, and he never fulfilled his to to his desire to the level of what he wished to re- to receive for his art. He never fulfilled that in his lifetime. He lived a very traumatic life. was in, was imprisoned by Franco and only painted when it was convenient for the family for him to paint in his garage so that's definitely the predominant one of of moving through the shadow aspect of uh going from a starving artist to a prosperous artist and i think many people listening can relate to that limiting belief around abundance whether you're an artist or not And again, the medium of creative expression now being the conduit in which we can transcend this limiting belief, because that's very important for people to realize is that creative energy also applies to the creative choice that we make to keep a limiting belief alive, right? This is, I want people to hear this, (laughs) the limiting beliefs that we have in our minds, mostly in our unconscious, they're staying there because they're staying there because we're deciding, choosing for them to stay there. Right. Every time we enact them and move through them, we're deciding that. And it could be very unconscious, don't get me wrong. But just like we have the same creative ability to keep them going, we have just as much, if not more, creative ability to transcend them, to weed the garden, weed the thought garden of these beliefs that no longer serve us. Taylor, I want to shift now here to another topic within this artistic, creative conversation that we're having here today and it's one of the things that you offer the world and express to the world in the sort of what you do as an artist and it's this idea of energetic portraits and i want to ask about them so maybe you can explain what they are but i also want you to hit on and we'll go deeper into this hit on energetic portraits as a way to tap into your truth So, so ex- my energetic- explain first what they are and then we can go deeper into it. <laughs> okay. So energetic portraits, uh, so there's basically two, two ways I run this, this because I have international clients as well as Australian-based clients. So I run the Australian-based clients as a, it's a sacred ritualistic experience. So simply put, energetic portraits are a digital artwork with a spiritual transmission that I've drawn over the top of the photograph. So they are channel transmissions that a that are aimed at the client for their particular time and chapter in their embodiment journey, tapping into both the messages that they need to receive and they need to hear. And also it is a big part of it is really reconnecting them to not only the physical body, to the beauty and the divine expression that they are and that they uh, walk through life with, but it's also to reflect that they are nature themselves, helping them reconnect to the animal kingdom. Uh, The process that I take them through, it's a four to five hour process. We go out onto the land and we reconnect to, so I like to ask the client which element that they want to connect into. Predominantly it's, it's out in the bush. It's well, where we are in the never, never. So the water element. Um, And then we, how I run it is, 
we, I get my client to lay down and I do a bit of a, an opening ceremony, calling in the custodians of the land, sending my acknowledgements and prayers out to them. I call in the elementals. I call in all the guys that want to be there. And then we go through a basically personalized ritual. So that may look like a, dr- a sound healing with my drum mm-hmm. that I have. We do a lot of uh, safe space, talking into mm-hmm. the intention of this space, what they want to release, what they want to receive, how they want to walk out into the world after this experience. And then we start the process of them shedding the layers. So that mm. looks like them sitting up in front of me and taking up the piece of clothing because then I do a channeled, uh, I do it also a channeled physical piece wherever they want it on their body. Mm. Predominantly it's on the chest because that's the heart area. So that's the most activating for them. And throughout this whole process, I'm singing, I'm speaking to them, I'm, I'm helping them relax because the process of getting naked in front of someone yep. is confronting. It's it's your becoming your most vulnerable self. So let me uh, let me jump in here, Taylor. So there's a lot in that, <laughs> and we're gonna I'm gonna come back to the channeling piece here in a second because I want I want to break down that separately. But let's take a step backwards here, and I want to ask about so this whole that whole process that you just outlined. It's you know, in many ways, it's a shamanic journey for a lot of people that what you just outlined is, you know, you're walking people across the rainbow bridge and you're helping them pull back a lot of the layers that may have been disguising in reality, what they actually are. And I think if you were just listening to Taylor break down that, those series of steps, there are a lot of things there and, and Taylor I'm sure she can correct me if I'm wrong, but Taylor has chosen these specific tools because they resonate to her. But the thing that is most important is that she's connecting into her divine source so she can create the loving container needed for the person to come in, to walk in, to receive, so they can pull back and connect to their divine source. And that is the thing that comes up and out and expresses through the art that she makes, expresses through the vulnerability of being naked and that's sort of what I want to ask now, Taylor. What do you? What are some of the responses you see of people as they are moving through this process? What? And just to explain it a little bit more, how these energetic portraits are done. The part of it where she does an artwork is that the person is naked, and then she adds on the channel transmission through the artistic medium. So, I'm wondering, Taylor, what are what are some and keep people anonymous but what are some what are some re- reactions that you've noticed people going through this process like is there a lot of tears mm. is there a lot of shedding of limiting beliefs what mm-hmm. what have you noticed comes up so i want to touch on both a, a feminine aspect and the, and the masculine aspect because i do take both the feminine and the masculine through this process so the most recent masculine uh that I took through this process, it was quite, he was quite nervous. I mean, you can say that for both the feminine and the masculine. It is a, it is a, it's a shedding process. And whenever it's a shedding process, the, the ego gets involved and, and there's a loss of identity. There's uh, a new identity that's being birthed, which can cause a lot of uncomfortability in within the body. The the I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to not mention any names. <laughs> The masculine that I just took through, he was it, it was quite vulnerable for him. He was quite emotional, particularly with the the drumming that I we we probably spent maybe close to five to ten minutes within this this specific container. He was he got quite emotional, and he he dropped into the frequency of the drum and actually started vocalizing and chanting and oming, and it was it was really beautiful and humbling to to really watch and to see him really, it felt like there was dissolving of some sort of layer that needed to be released. And through that frequency of the drum, it was, he was able to do that. And so I also want to touch on, I take the process quite slowly. So the the people that I take through, it's not an initial stripping off of the clothes. <clears throat> it's a process. So that doesn't happen until the very end of the journey, basically, where 
we have gone through the drumming, we've gone through the journal prompts, we've done an oracle card reading and the, when they're sitting up to receive the channeling of the artwork, they are still semi-closed because that in itself is still, I'm in their vicinity, I'm in their personal field, even that in itself can be confronting to most people. So it's a very loving, gentle, very mother-like kind of energy of easing them into the final like catapulting of close off, let's do this. With the the masculine that I took through, he experienced a, a um I guess you could say a self-actualization, a self-realization of, of the embodiment that he was calling in, that he was manifesting. He already was that in the space. He got to see that and acknowledge that. So it was a very emotional journey for him. I did also acknowledge that, you know, when you're having photographs taken of you naked in front of the camera with a person that you haven't met in the flesh yet can also take you through the, the triggers and yep. the, and you're moving through the blockages yep. in real time. Yep. So there's waves. It's a wave. It's yep. you, they relax, they release, they come up, they feel high, they go back down. There's another blockage. It's like a, it's a very, this is why my totem animal is a snake. It's a journey. And it's also like, that's why I've got snake medicine because they're shedding skins. They're going through portals and they do it all over again. Yeah. The, 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 the recent feminine that I took through. Well, Taylor, also- let me, let me jump in here. Cause before you get to the feminine, I want to hit on the masculine piece. And cause we have been talking predominantly about the feminine energy here today and the feminine divine feminine, both in men and female, but we've been speaking about the physical female through the menstrual act Right. I just, for all the male listeners that might be tuning in today, this is just as much for you as it is for all the females. Right. And, you know, minus the menstrual blood element that we were speaking about at the start of the episode, all of these creative elements, all of these sacral traumas, all of these energetic elements that we deserve to lean into is just a, as much of a masculine conversation. And we need to, I think we need to create a space. I think this is a big part of the work that you do, Taylor, that I think is very beautiful and powerful is that through the, the womb center and the, the embodied feminine energy that you are stepping into with the artistic expression through the womb space, what it's now doing is it's inviting the wounded masculine to come in, right? It's inviting the wounded male that, as you said, may have all those layers of shame, of guilt, of trauma, of being unable to look at themselves in a mirror or, you know, I'm sure people listening can add in their own story. This this divine feminine starts to be an invitation. And as Taylor said, the external is an invitation of what Taylor is talking about. So she is the f- embodiment of the female and it's inviting a man in. But once the man is in your container, Taylor, you're walking them home back to their inner feminine. So the male that might be wounded, the male that might be, that might have challenges, their divine feminine is healing in your presence. Does that mm-hmm. resonate, Tad? Do you Have you noticed that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to think of... So thank you. I acknowledge that love received. Uh, I like to think of the work that I do is I am, am of course, holding a container of the divine feminine, but I'm also a walking mirror. I'm just reflecting back to them the love that they already are. I'm holding that space for them to be able to see it and acknowledge it and walk away from that space and and know it within their cells. Yeah. I think that's a, yeah, it's the love on the love piece that we're talking about before. So I I interrupt Mm. and keep, so continue with the so you talked about the masculine you talked about the divine masculine mm. responses and come out and then what have you noticed in the the female the female energy mm-hmm. so the female a lot of my female clients the energy the the journey that they go through is a very simply put is as realizing their divinity their beauty their worthiness of inhabiting this really emotionally intelligent, cyclical body that is immensely powerful and coming home to that realisation. I have had, you know, a lot of my clients, it's all profound in, in the 
in their own unique way what it brings up for them. But with this one particular female client, it helped her move through her sexual trauma and made her realise her, like I've just touched on, her power and the immensity of of who she is and what she brings forth into, into this world. And for that particular energetic portrait that I drew, that I channeled, I wanted to highlight to her her spiritual gifts. And she's never seen, she had never seen her spiritual gifts highlighted in that way before I drew that portrait for her. Mm-hmm. So it was very multi-layered. So the, the, the ritual that I take them through in person is one container in and of itself. But then when they receive the portrait, the, the photographs, and the actual portrait, the energetic portrait, is another it's layer proof. of messages within that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a loving, artistic proof of what they actually are. So now they don't, mm. now they can't even ignore it. Now it's like there. It's, yeah. uh, I think that <laughs> it's is the evidence. Yeah, it's the evidence. It's the, oh, I can, I can suppress this. I can decide to suppress this in the future. But the, now I have a, a physical representation of the thing mm. that I'm ignoring. And mm-hmm. I think that in itself is a, a beautiful mirror to look at. So uh, mm-hmm. thank you, Taylor, for breaking that down. I think I hope that gives people an understanding and a connection to the process Taylor moves through. And, and I think as you can acknowledge, this is now more than just a, an artwork. This is now more than just a creative process. This is really, as Taylor said, a removing of the skins and the layers restricting us from what we actually are and, and allowing the birthing of our gifts, our love, our healing, all the things that we deserve to move through. So I want to, I have two more sort of topics I want to hit on here before we finish Taylor. And I want to come back. I will come back to the channeling. I think we'll end with that. Cause I think it's very important for people to understand, but very quickly let's highlight on, and let's highlight and hit on the spirit animals and where, cause I know the spirit animals are a big part of, you know, what you're sort of exploring within the creation process, but where do, where do spirit animals fit into all of this? Why, why do you think they're important within the creative act and especially sort of what you're starting to evolve and step into in this world? Mm, So (laughs) animals in and of themselves have been present in my life, in our lives, Harry, since we were babies, since we were in the womb and, I like to think of animals as my spirit guides. They are the bridge between the worlds for me. They are my guidance. They are there when specific events happen for knowledge to, for me to sink in the knowledge that I probably wouldn't have received any other way. So my logo is a snake with red feathers around it, which symbolizes my two, I guess, power animals, my spirit animals, uh, my totem animals. So the snake is represents transformation, alchemization, shedding of skins, just, and it's very heavily intertwined with feminine. And the feathers are a red, red cockatoo feathers and yellow tail feathers. And so they are a bird predominantly based around where we are, uh, and they are a, a bird that's really uh, associated with spirit. And every time I hear red tail cockatoo, I am instantly reminded just to, to anchor back into myself. It's like a, it's like a, Hey, do you remember me? Do you remember spirit? Remember your, remember your, your soul's mission, your alignment, walk in that path. Remember, keep on going. So I heavily read into the symbology of animals. I do work with certain books, but I also like to anchor in and make a highlight point that it's whatever the animal means to you in that specific time in that moment. You can read about what an animal means in many different books, but it really, it, it, what, it, what it means is the emotions that come in, with you at that time. Yeah, that's the, so it's a beautiful breakdown. And I think another thing to take away from this for people, I did a episode at the point when this one is releasing, I encourage people to, listen back to an episode I did with Mr. Martin on the shamanic journey. And in that, in that episode, we talked about spirit animals, not just being guides, but we talked about what a totem animal is. And when we bring animals into the artistic act, especially if the artistic act is also connected to a, a journey or a shamanic exploration, much like what Taylor is describing, 
now they give they're a light in the darkness. They start to remind us of our power, right? So they're not just guides to say, hey, go here. They're also guides to be like, hey, go here because you can do this, right? They're guides and they remind you of some, a characteristic that you mm-hmm. might have, right? The, the leopard being the, the lone strong power or the, or the you know, we, we just before this chat, Taylor, what, what was the spirit animal that, that came up in the, in the book? It was the Uh, one. The oracle cards. Well, I got the grasshopper and I also got the black swan. Yeah. And like Taylor said, we could look at a dictionary definition of those and the and the sort of foundational uh, uh, themes that they have across for everyone. But then we can also ask ourselves, what does that black swan represent to me? And what is it reminding me of that's been there the whole time? So that's a very important thing to realize. And I guess. I guess the last piece I'll add and then we'll move on here. We also have to realize, and this is something just to sit with, just to plant a seed for people's awareness. As a soul, especially in human form, we probably haven't always been a soul in human form. And if we have a specific connection to a certain spirit animal, so let's say we have a beautiful sausage dog that is in our lives, do we have ask ourselves the question, do we have a connection to that sausage dog because she is a guide? Or is our soul really familiar with that specific form because we have lived in that form before, right, in a past life? Has our, has our soul incarnated as a, as a dog species, as, as, a, as a locust, as a bear, as a, you know, insert the animal here? So just something else for people to sit with around spirit animals and in the artistic form. Taylor, I have one one more question to finish, but before we get to that, I do want to hit on just to finish up this episode on channeling and channeling through the artistic medium and specifically channeling. And we've been talking about this all episode here, channeling divinity, channeling our unconditional love, channeling our connection to source, to God, whatever your name is for it. And I want to ask your response to this, right? What, how have you noticed this ability to connect to your divine source, channeling higher messages? How has it start to how has it started to develop through the artistic expression? And what advice would you give other people to maybe mm. tap into this? This beautifully ties up the entire conversation. It goes back to the start of the conversation of when I really connected back into my womb space. That was when I became open. I was open to my abilities. Up until that point, I was, uh, I guess, very blindsided to the fact that I that I think we all are our channels, but specifically with this artistic medium, I did not become aware of it until I, you know, <clears throat> I travelled for two years, I came home, I started to do self-development work, I was um, in safe containers with psychedelic journeys and plant medicine journeys. And I started to realize that I was receiving uh, very cosmic messages from the, from the get go. How I would, what, how would I recommend for someone to tap into the channeling abilities is to first, firstly, become well acquainted and befriend your perfectionist. Because in any sort of artistic expression, be it poetry, be it uh, songwriting, painting, and dancing, I think we ourselves get in our own way of nurturing. Uh, of developing and even knowing that we are a channel. So really just acknowledging that your perfectionist is going to come in and say that that is a, that is a pathetic drawing, that you can't draw anything, that we've been programmed into believing that art has to, be, has to look and feel and be presented in a certain way. So I would just recommend uh, feeling into that place of your expression, whatever it is, and really setting time uh, a space where you will not be disturbed, where your phone is nowhere near you, unless it's for music, because I personally feel that when I'm in flow, so my three expressions, well, two expressions that to dance and, and art form has been heavily influenced by music because that drops me into this uh, parath- parasympathetic state state where I'm flow I'm you know I'm really enjoy there's nothing that I'm thinking about not not contemplating my to-do list I'm in that play state and from that play state that's when I'm able to 
work to my best ability to get out of my way, to allow the messages that want to come through and not second guess them. That's where the perfectionist comes in. It's like the second guessing of, is that actually something that's worthwhile painting or is it actually a message with a profound meaning for both me and somebody else who's whoever is going to look upon my work? Mm. Yeah, I think <laughs> and another another word I would <laughs> connect to the perfectionist is trauma. <laughs> mm. Often mm. being a perfectionist stems from, you know, wanting to control everything and controlling mm-hmm. everything is often a mask for some co- sort of deeper wound of betrayal or abandonment mm-hmm. or rejection or humiliation. So mm-hmm. I think everything you said is beautiful. And I would, what I would add to it in this relationship to becoming a channel through our artistic expression is also to realize one, we are all channels, right? This is not a Harrison mm-hmm. or Taylor thing. We are all beautiful channels to our divine self, our higher self, our consciousness, our unconditional love. And two, realizing that we're actually channeling all the time. It's just most of us are channeling through our trauma. Most of us are channeling through our shadow. Most of us are channeling through our our elements that we haven't brought into the light, right? So we're connecting to a higher space of unconditional love, maybe through meditation, maybe through art, maybe through sex, maybe through the animal natural world. And then when we go to bring that truth and express it through the physical body, we're expressing it through our wounds that we've yet to heal. So this is the other side to it that I would recommend on top of Taylor's tips here is do the trauma work, right? And realizing that when you do the trauma work, right, you're allowing your innate love to be expressed more in its purest potential, right? So now you become a channel, not just a channel that maybe speaks some words or, 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 or channels a ascended master. That's, that's secondary, you become a channel that now expresses that divine love through your frequency, right? A frequency that is not traumatized. Taylor, I love you very much. And I hope that this experience was valuable for you. And I'm happy that you're able to share your truth, share your love with the world. The intention of this chat was to get more of your beautiful voice out there into the cosmos so people can hear and connect uh, it was also an opportunity for you to speak more about what you do, because I think you do need to speak more about, it, as we've heard today, there's so much beauty in what you are expressing with the world. If people have connected to that beauty today and want to find out more, want to connect to the things that you're offering, where do you want to direct them? What do you want to give them here today? Well, I'm <clears throat> most easily contactable through Instagram and or Facebook. I also have a website with my entire body of work where you can see my acrylic artworks, my watercolour body of work, my menstrual body of work and all my energetic portraits and testimonials. And you can also contact me through via email, but all of that is on my link tree and my Instagram. And I'm sure you'll probably post that, Harry, won't you? Yep. All all the details Tal just mentioned will be in the show notes. You can click your podcast player, click the details and you'll see all of those links and that process, that transformational process that's in your link tree too, that, um, that shamanic journey. We take people through the energetic portraits. Uh, yep. Yeah. So through my, through my link tree, you can book a connection call where we yep. can chat about the sacred ritualistic experience, which is the four to five hour experience that I have in person. Uh, but on the connection call on my discovery, uh, on my Calendly, you can book, you can book in a connection call for anything. So from a print sale to an original artwork sale to also the embodiment coaching, you can also click in for there as well. So you can find that all in my link tree. Beautiful. Taylor, before we finish here, I have one final question here on the podcast that I ask everyone. The intention of the Cosmic Love Antenna is to connect to that divine source inside of you. That is a space of love so we can express it out into the cosmos with everyone that deserves it. So I'm wondering through your journey, through your life, where have you landed with a definition of that love word? Oh. <laughs> wow. That's an incredibly 
challenging question. For me, it's more of a feeling state of uh, it's the feeling I get when I'm in my in my flow state, when I'm dancing, when I'm in my flow state, when I'm painting art. It's a it's a all encompassing, encapsulating feeling of like vibration of just yeah. So it's a really difficult answer for me to articulate because I'm more of a feeling movement art kind of articulation it's a vibrational state of pure love (laughs) I think that's a beautiful I think that's a beautiful definition and we have to remember that we interpret reality through all of our senses right so just because we might speak about love in a certain way doesn't mean that expression of love is any less valuable than a feeling or a hearing or a smelling or a tasting sense of love. So beautiful, my beautiful sister, all you listeners out there in the podcast world, thank you for tuning in today. If you got some value out of this podcast, remember you can share it with someone that you love very deeply, share it to that mom, that dad, that brother, that friend that might need an extra extra dose of inner creative connection and expression. If you got some tips out of this, remember you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts with maybe the tip that you got and you can tag myself and Taylor in that. But until then, me and Taylor love you very much. We'll catch you next time here on the podcast on the Cosmic Love Antenna. We wish you a wonderful evening, morning, and afternoon, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Cosmic Love Antenna podcast. We hope you enjoyed. Be sure to follow Harrison on Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at Harrison Ma. That's Harrison, M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Acid.